problem with empowerment. Hello, my name is Emma Rockenbeck. I'm 19 years old and I live in Seattle, Washington. I just completed my Thinking Beyond Borders Global Gap Year with the TBB West group. On this program, I've questioned my own assumptions again and again, and I've learned to value incomplete answers in the gray area between two truths. I am a leader. I've thought myself as a leader for years, but until this trip, I never truly knew what that meant. The purpose of TBB is to create agents of change. To me, an agent of change is a leader. An agent of change is someone who is aware of the world around them, who wishes to, to facilitate change in their community in order to create true sustainability. Inevitably, leaders deal with the concept of power. There is power in knowledge, and there is power in our words. There is also power in the knowledge of where our words come from, what assumptions lie behind them. Empowerment. I used to live this word. I used it all the time. It was a catchphrase I could attack with at any moment, attached to any cause I was passionate about. Women's empowerment, youth empowerment, LGBTQA empowerment. I had the best intentions using this word, but by using it, I was perpetuating a cycle that had the opposite effect, I hope saying empowerment would have. Think about this word for a moment. Empowerment. And power. I am going to empower you. Imparting power giving power to you, power moving in one direction from the top down. When I use this word, I am saying I have the power you do not have, let me give it to you. You need me to give you this power you do not already possess. Ouch. This does not sit right with me anymore. Let me take you through my trip, through my life, and explain to you why. This winter, in Jaipur, India, I fell apart. In that foggy, cramped, cluttered city, my world was turned upside down, jumbled inside my head like the cluttered streets I navigated. In Jaipur, I was confronted with poverty and inequality. But worse, I was confronted with eye-opening words written by philosophers that turned my gaze inward, back to where I came from. I saw how I was part of a social construct, a worldwide system of inequality that perpetuated the poverty and violence I was just now seeing. Words are powerful. Brazilian philosopher Paula Freire writes, this structure, the struggle is possible only because dehumanization, although a concrete historical fact, is not a given destiny, but the result of an unjust order that engenders violence in the oppressors, which in turn dehumanizes the oppressed. Freire sees that injustice in this world is being perpetuated by one great social contract, a system we are stuck in. This system consists of oppressors and oppressed. The oppressors are those who hold onto the system and keep it in place because the system benefits them. In benefiting them, however, it dehumanizes everyone else, creating the oppressed. In dehumanizing the oppressed, the humanity of the oppressor is leached as well. In the end, all parties are harmed at the deepest level. To Freire, true generosity does not manifest as the oppressors giving charity, aid, help to the oppressed. Rather, it means the oppressed and oppressor seeing the system for what it is and breaking it down so all people can be fully realized as human beings. Put in his words, true generosity consists precisely in fighting to destroy the causes which nourish false charity. False charity constrains the fearful, full and subdued, the rejects of life, to extend their trembling hands. True generosity lies in striving so that these hands, whether individuals or entire peoples, may be extended less and less in supplication so that more and more they become human hands which work and, working, transform the world. After reading Freire, I realized I had been an oppressor my whole life. No matter how much money my family gives to Hope Link, no matter how many times we host Tensity in our church's backyard, no matter how many times I help fundraise for pennies for peace, I was doing nothing to change the system we were locked into, integral and vital part of giving and giving and giving and never see. After a period of dark mourning from my lost naivete and a moment of identity panic, <laughs> I stepped back and took a look at the community and family back home that I love. Everyone back home I care about cares about me um, because they hold respect and love as their most cherished values. How could these same people be oppressors in truth? 
Just because we are wittingly part of a system does not mean we want to be part of it. We can't not want to be part of it if we don't know it exists. Opening our eyes to it will be the painful part. What Freire describes as a painful birth. The birth of someone realizing they are part of an unjust social order. My mom considers herself a Unitarian Universalist humanist. I am a Unitarian Universalist as well, otherwise, no, otherwise known as UU. Unitarian Universalism is respect for all people, the affirmation of love and peace. We have no rev book of revelations, no messiah, no prophets, because we believe that every person's spiritual path is unique, and that what truly matters is how we treat each other in this life, not what happens after we die. I have been stumbling confusedly down my own path for years as I look into what it means to be a UU. But until this trip, I never thought to look deeply into what it means to be a humanist as opposed to a humanitarian. For years, I've held the first principle of Unitarian Universalist Association's covenant as the base for all my choices and interactions. The affirmation of the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Within this principle, I discovered a door into what it means to be a humanist. Imagine your friend is going through a tough time in her life. She just lost her job, has three kids to take care of, and her mother is sick. You could have sent her, her messages full of pity or sent her money. This would be humanitarian style help, the false charity fairy speaks of. But instead, you go to her house, ask her what kind of support she needs from you. She tells you that she needs you to watch her kids for a few days while she goes to visit her mom and while she applies to a new job. You would respect her inherent worth and dignity, so you do not treat her in a condescending way or create a situation where she becomes entirely dependent on you. You simply extend your empathy and compassion towards this other human being you care about. This is humanism. So as humanists stuck in an oppressive system dominated by humanitarian thought, how can we liberate ourselves, and how can we create a world where everyone is able to liberate themselves? If we try to hand out freedom, hand out power, we are perpetuating the cycle of dependence and control that holds us all prisoner. While still in India and grappling with these conundrums, we read Amartya Sen, a contemporary Indian philosopher, and he provided me with a path to follow in attempting to describe ways to escape the system. While Sen talks about development on an international scale, his logic can be used to describe the development of human societies and social structures on a smaller scale. Sen asserts that all people want economic freedom and freedom of thought, and most importantly, freedom to make decisions. To him, developing is a process of expanding the real freedoms that people enjoy. He sees human beings as capable individuals only need opportunities to participate in society and be fully human, fully free. For society to be free, all people have to have these opportunities, which come in the form of access. When people have access to capitalize on their human potential, they have agency. If people need agency to have true freedom, and need true freedom to be fully human, then we need to create more access and opportunities. The way I see the system that Ferry describes, there is no way to create equal opportunities for all people within it. But creating more space for freedom is a start. The ironic thing about the situation is that the whole time our TV group was sitting around discussing how to change the social constructs of the world and free humankind, we were also working to teach children in the slums of Jaipur the English language. We were empowering them by teaching them the language they vitally needed to know to secure career jobs that would lift them out of poverty. But by doing this, we were contributing to what I see as humanitarian aid and fulfilling our roles as oppressors. We were a group of unqualified white kids on an expensive gap year flying halfway across the world to teach children for a month and then leave to soon be replaced by another set of volunteers. Not to say that our every effect on these kids' lives was negative. We made wonderful personal connections with them and learned for, more from them than we could ever hope to teach them. The problem I had with our being there was the question I kept asking myself, day in, day out. Are we truly liberating these children? These young people were full of curiosity, the will to explore and learn that is so innately human. They were full of human potential. All they needed was access to freedom. We were freeing them by, uh, were we freeing them by teaching them English? I never felt like it. These children did not want to sit down and read and write and look at a whiteboard and neat little rows. I wanted nothing more than to let them draw and sing and dance and play games all day 
and try to incorporate this wild fun into our lessons. I wanted them to want to be there, to fulfill this curiosity and ingenuity they were so full of. To me, India and India's children felt vibrant and full of life and color and rhythm. We were asked time and again, however, to sit them down to fulfill our roles as oppressive teachers and fill their heads with letters and words that may not have been relevant to their lives at all, as if their minds were empty vessels. To me, this was not liberation. It was not what I had set out to do on this trip. I had set out to empower these children, and that was what I was doing, but it was not right. The humanist in me suffered. I was immensely relieved upon arriving in South Africa to find that this time around, we would be asked to play a passive role in our work studies. We were to follow healthcare workers around the townships they worked and lived in, and were purely there to learn from them. <laughs> My healthcare worker was a young mother who had grown up in a rural Nosa speaking village named Apendule. I call her Apesh, apparently I say her full name. <laughs> I became her shadow, trailing behind her as she walked up and down the rows of government issued houses and scrap metal shacks in the scorching sun. The township of Kwanakatula where we worked was her home her community, her life. She acted as the vein of the great breathing body the township was, carrying life and vitality like blood with her wherever she went. We sat together and listened to the people of Kwanakatula's stories, their sorrows, their struggles. We administered med medicine and tested blood pressure, but we also administered hope. Apesh is such an amazing woman. She can be quiet and serious, a sponge soaking up the pain of others. She been feisty and sassy, telling me just what she thinks of those who presume to treat her with anything less than equality. She can be a gentle smile, a loving mother, a problem solver, and someone who stares injustice in the eye and challenges it to come out and play. She has strength. She has power. When I have thought about women in Africa long before this trip, and the prospect of working side by side with an actual woman who lived in the actual country of South Africa was not even a perceived possibility. I am ashamed to admit that I succumbed to seeing them through the lens of their stereotypes. I pictured women who were broken and suffering, who were abused and trodden on and constantly fighting to simply live, let alone live happily. I thought if I was ever doing development related work in Africa, I would be empowering the women I met and made personal connections with. What I found when I encountered Apesh was a woman who can smile, who can joke around and tell me I am being silly, who can dance and sing like an angel and make fun of everyone around her. Apesh certainly does not need me to empower her. Apesh made me humble. She is so full of power and strength, full of human potential, and she's putting it to use, not for herself, but from the goodness and empathy in her heart. She is using the will and force already inside her to access freedom that she shares with her community. She has power. But wait, there is a catch. Apesh has human potential and inner strength. Does she hold a position of power from the system? Although Apesh is looked up to by her patients and community members, she does not have access to true freedom, the true equality within the system. She is still treated in an unfair way by her employers and still has very few opportunities as a black woman in South Africa. She has power, and she doesn't have power. It was not until my return to the States that I realized why the word empowerment bugged me. It is because there are two kinds of power. The human power and potential that Sen described as capabilities, and the structural power that is handed out as posts of authority, which is created by the system that Ferry depicts. If we say we are going to empower someone, meaning we are going to give them structural power, we are ignoring the fact that they have human power. There are two types of power, and only one word. So why not just create two words, make it clear that you recognize the human power within each person, then empower them by giving them structural power. Because structural power cannot be given to all, and is by definition selective and rooted in inequality to truly recognize each person's human power, to look them in the eye and say, I see the power in you, to truly create a freedom that each person can be fully human within, the whole system must crash to the ground, be pulled out by the roots. Older than the system, older than all the prejudices and hate we hold now, is a universal recognition of humanity. Ubuntu, namaste, aloha.
you may be saying, wait, Emma, this is all very beautiful, all this talk about recognition of humanity, but how do we apply this to our real lives? This is the question I've been struggling with as an emerging leader and an agent of change. I do not have one answer for you, beyond recognizing that my ideal world, one without the system, will not come to pass soon, or without work, or maybe it will never come to be at all. So how can we be leaders within the system that's already in place and still create as much freedom for human potential to bloom within as possible? How do we create access, respect the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and show we care without becoming cogs in the machine of humanitarian false generosity? I believe there's a gradient of leadership styles. A gradient that ranges from different styles of completely oppressive totalitarian rule on one side to different styles of free and non-oppressive leadership on the other side. On the far end of the side which represents freedom from the system, it peters out into fuzziness because I have no idea at all what a truly free world will look like. Nor does anyone, I think. When I look at some of the most freeing leadership styles I've witnessed, I see humanist, caring people who've devoted their lives to unleashing every person's human potential. I also see the problems with these styles of leadership that keep them within the system, no matter how hard they try to break free from it, no matter to what degree they succeed. The last three years of my life have been devoted to becoming an effective and non-oppressive leader within the Pacific Northwest District, PNWD, UU Youth Community. I attended my first youth conference, CON, in 10th grade and was immediately hooked. The CONs create a place where every single person is welcome, where every single person can be themselves, where acceptance and respect govern every, every interaction. CON is a bubble within the system that shows what a world without the system could look like. At CON, every person's voice is heard and every person is a leader. It takes every person's active inclusion to make a space that is truly liberating where human power is seen and acknowledged. The summer after 10th grade, I attended Goldmine Leadership School, and, 11, and in 11th grade, I joined the PNWD Youth Empowerment Services team. Yes, team. Our job at conferences was to uphold the community we all worked so hard to create, and to be a support network for the other youth and adults that were present. The space created at CON is similar to the space created within the TBB program. In TBB, no one is right or wrong, and transparency and equality are the rule, not the exception. Looking back at Yes Team now, with the new perspectives I gained through TBB, I question how truly freeing the leadership I participated in was. Khan felt like the epitome of a free and equitable community, but wasn't really. The leadership team I was part of had the word empowerment in its very name, Yes Team. I have so many questions about how this name came to be what, what it means to those who created it, and what it means for the whole, whole UU youth community to have the word empowerment used so often and so lightly. Perhaps future UU youth leaders have a long way to go in changing the language we use. I still believe that, con, that the con community 